Uh, we're here for part two of a three-part planned series of videos refuting Dr. Gavin Ortland on the bodily assumption of Mary yet again, probably video number five, six, and seven. We've put out a number of them. <clears throat> um, why is it important? Well, we're covering new material now. And uh, particularly now, we're going to be going over the supposed assumption of of uh, of biblical figures list. Apparently, this is a important point, important enough for Gavin Ortland to focus upon, that in the early church, there are a number of lists from church fathers. So, for instance, you've got a number of early fathers that produce lists of people that are bodily assumed. And but Mary never comes up in the early church fathers. And apparently Gavin Ortland has put together a list of early church fathers that talk about the bodily assumptions of various different figures, figures like Enoch and Elijah. But Mary never comes up. So apparently this is a very big problem for Catholics to deal with. And, and we're, we read the title of the video called Why Mary's Assumption is Indefensible. And indeed, Gavin has said this is something that should uh, make one either turn Protestant or remain Protestant. I don't remember the exact words he's used. But uh, again, you're going to find that uh, yet again, and you're perhaps by this point, you are not shocked that yet again, there's nothing there. Now, we want to be clear because the other day, the other day, they reached out to me and somebody asked me, William, what would convince you? Is there any kind of work being done by Protestants in this area that you appreciate? And I've pointed out many times that Alpha and Omega's Turretin and Chapa have done work here. We debated them on the issue. issue. And unlike Gavin, they've read the material, they've read the fathers, and they put forth, in my opinion a much more robust case, which I still think fails, because I believe the bodily assumption of Mary is ancient, biblical and ancient. So, but to be very fair, I don't want people to think, well, I laugh off every claims of every Protestant. No, we deal with them. In fact, nobody is doing more work in Mariology than we are here. Nobody. There's only one channel out there right now that is pumping out a ton of Mariology material with brand new patristic quotes that previously did not exist in English, books on Mariology, debates on Mariology. There's only one channel doing it. It's us here, nobody else. So we do take it very seriously. And we do look at the claims being made. We don't merely swipe away and say, well, we can't take that claim seriously, which is why I'm doing a whole video alone on the supposed lists of those that were bodily assumed in heaven where we don't have Holy Mary. We're going to begin by hearing what Dr. Orland has to say. But we also have numerous lists of the people that are understood to have been assumed bodily to heaven. I want you to be very careful here. Dr. Orland has claimed, is claiming that we have in our possession numerous lists of people that are bodily assumed in heaven. That assumes that the fathers that he's going to quote from and great church writers he's going to quote from are attempting to catalog a list of those that are bodily assumed in heaven. That right away does assume that. So Dr. Ortland is making that claim. Don't come to me and tell me, well, William, you know, Dr. Ortland didn't make that claim. Dr. Ortland merely claimed that they mention a few that are assumed, but Mary doesn't come up. No, Dr. Orlin claimed that there are lists of assumption figures, those that are bodily assumed. They're actual lists that are produced by these fathers. And if we show that claim from Dr. Orlin to be false, then what do we do? What do we go from there? I, I, you know, I'm sick and tired of being told that I'm unfair to Gavin, that I'm mean to Gavin. You know, that Gavin, you won't debate me because William's a big old meanie. No, we know why Gavin won't debate. And there's nothing about me, William, being incredibly special at all. 
at all. It's nothing. I don't think, do I think Gavin is afraid of me? No, I don't. No, I'm not arguing that. I think what Gavin does not want is to have his material taken apart bit by bit in a debate. Doesn't want that. And Gavin knows very well if he ever debated me on any topic, any topic in regards to Mariology, Gavin knows that I'm going to take his material apart. There's no possible way he'll ever debate me. But he will try to vilify me and try to make you think, well, William is a big old meanie. What a bad guy. I'm not going to debate him. He's a bad guy. He's a mean guy. Uncharitable. He's a guy, you know, that, that is why I don't debate him. No, that, that don't believe that. Do not allow Dr. Ortland to trick you into believing that the reason why he will not debate me is because I am a big old meanie. Get that out of your head already. I've debated tons of people, and I've debated them over and over and over and over again, and you only have one guy making that claim. Out of the tons of scholars and top apologists and theologians I've debated, you got one guy crying foul, Dr. Ortland. Don't believe it. Don't believe it. I remain good friends, but even with top atheists to this day, every year calling up figures like John Loftus or Dr. Price and, you know, telling them, hey, when are y'all going to become Catholic? You know, I, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to quit crushing you in debate after debate until you're there worshiping at a Catholic church with me or at a Catholic church, period. Point is, I remain good friends with you to this day. But you don't want to hear about who I remain good friends with. Who cares about that? What you want is you want to dig into those early church father lists that were told the father is produced. I'll go through a number of these. When Tertullian is expounding the perfection of the resurrection body, he lists Enoch and Elijah as his examples of those who are translated to heaven. Elsewhere, when he's defending the view that the death, that the debt of sin includes death, he gives two exceptions to that, Enoch and Elijah. There's all... Yeah, we're going to hear a little bit more. Two other passages in Tertullian where he's basically discussing Elijah's assumption, the nature of heaven, the nature of the resurrection body, Mary never comes up. ...is that we have a lack of discussion of translations to heaven. Tertullian has a book on the resurrection of the flesh where he recounts Enoch, Elijah, Paul, all the people who were translated to heaven, never brings up Mary. Okay. Yeah, uh, number one, uh, Gavin is wrong here. Um, Tertullian is not trying to recount everyone that is bodily translated. That's not the point of what Tertullian is trying to do. In fact, if you look at the context of what Tertullian is trying to do, Tertullian says, all nations have to ascend to the Mount of the Lord. Indeed, the point he's trying to make is to counter the heresy that not all have to die. No, all have to die. And the point of him bringing up Enoch and Elijah is because he was one of the early ecclesiastical writers that believed that they would return and suffer martyrdom. So his point is all die, even those, even those saints that avoided and evaded death originally, Enoch and Elijah being bodily translated, they will return and they will have to be martyred according to him. Remember, the early church did not teach that St. Mary was martyred. His desire was to talk about even those that escaped this kind of death because they were bodily translated would have to return to die. The teaching of the church, the earliest fathers, is very clear. And this is not what Tertullian is referring to. Tertullian is talking about the fact that Enoch and Elijah didn't die, but they will return and they'll suffer martyrdom. This is a very different context. The idea is not to catalog all those that have been bodily translated. And even at that, the earliest traditions, the um, preponderance of evidence shows a belief in the death of St. Mary or the holy falling asleep and her bodily assumption. Uh, e even, even if Tertullian didn't believe in it, this is not even close to being a denial of it. Uh, I think context is very important. And in, in this section of Dianima, uh, clearly Gavin's not, uh, not dealing with Tertullian in his context, and that's problematic. All right, we, we have covered Tertullian before. Thought it'd be good to go back to the previous video rather than recording again what I had already laid out very clearly about Tertullian. But now we're going to look at Irenaeus, the great Saint Irenaeus. Now, we've already looked at one supposed list of 
figures that are bodily assumed and there is no such desire to catalog everybody that was bodily assumed in heaven is not there present in Tertullian. Now, what do we have in the great St. Irenaeus? First off, we're, we're talking about Irenaeus, Contra Heresies, Book 5, Chapter 5. But before we get there, in the very same book, Chapter 4, what is the context of what Irenaeus is dealing with? He is, notice he's dealing with those persons who are deceived, who feign another God the Father, besides the creator of the world, for he must have been feeble and useless, an impotent God, or else malignant and full of envy, if he be either unable or unwilling to extend eternal life to our bodies. So he's dealing with heretical claims. That is what he's dealing with right here. He's not trying to catalog a list of those that are bodily assumed in heaven. And we know that because we can go to the context. Let's do that right now. Whether it is the case then that they're that there, notice how they very have a di they have a different ideology of God, very different. The heretics, their father does not bestow life upon them when he has a power of so doing, or is it that he does not possess the power? Notice how we noted that Irenaeus is arguing, the great doctor of the church is arguing that their God is an impotent God. In their minds, of course, he doesn't have the power to bestow this. If on the one hand, it is because he cannot, he is upon that supposition, not a powerful being, nor is he more perfect than the creator. For the creator grants as me must perceive what he is unable to afford. But if on the other hand, if it be that he does not grant this, when he has the power of doing so, then he is proved to be not a good, but an envious and a malignant father. But look at what we read, the prolonged life of the ancients, the translation of Elijah and Enoch in their own bodies, as well as the preservation of Jonah's Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego in the midst of extreme peril, are clear demonstrations that God can raise up our bodies to life eternal. In order to learn that bodies did continue in existence for a lengthened period, as long as it was God's good pleasure that they should flourish, let the heretics, these heretics, read the Bible, and they'll find out that our predecessors advanced beyond 700, 800, 900 years of age, and their bodies kept pace with the protracted length of their days and participated in life as long as God willed that they should live. But why do I refer to these men now? We're finally getting to the point. He's not trying to produce a list of those that are bodily assumed in heaven, because he tells you, for Enoch, when he pleased God, was translated in the same body in which he did please him, thus pointing out by anticipation the translation of the just. Elijah too was caught up when he was yet in the substance of the natural form, thus exhibiting in prophecy the assumption of those who are spiritual, and that nothing stood in the way of their body being translated and caught up. For by means of the very same hands through which they were molded at the beginning, did they receive this translation and assumption. Let's go on. For an Adam, the hands of God had become accustomed to set in order to rule and to sustain his own workmanship and to bring it and place it where they pleased. Where, then, was the first man placed in paradise? Certainly, as the scripture declares, so he's pointing out to you that our God is not an impotent God. Very clear point. But notice the clear problem that we run into here. Irenaeus is talking about the great things God has done for his just ones. And he uses Enoch and Elijah as just figures as an example. Talks about those that live long, incredibly long lives, sustained by God. He's using particular examples. He is not making an exhaustive list of those that are bodily assumed or those that trans are translated to heaven. Let's hear Gavin again direct our physical bodies, he lists Enoch and Elijah, no mention of Mary. If we were to take this to its conclusion that he's giving a list of those that are translated into heaven, well, this would be going way too far because here in Against Heresies, book five, he does mention Enoch and Elijah, and then in another book he mentions Christ, and he doesn't mention Enoch and Elijah. He's not trying to produce an exhaustive list by any means. Rather, he's combating the heretics. 
he is showing the heretics that their, their idea of almighty God is not such an almighty God. By the way, we know that because you can find it right there in New Advent, Contra Heresies, Book 3, Chapter 12. The Apostle Peter, therefore, after the resurrection of the Lord and his assumption into the heavens. Do we have Enoch here? Enoch. No, we don't. Do we have Elijah here? No, we don't. Thus, we do not have in Irenaeus, in any of these areas, an attempt to catalog all of those that he believed that were bodily translated or assumed to heaven. We need to be very careful with the kind of argumentation that we put forth, because we're told that the great Irenaeus, we're told that these early fathers have produced lists of those that were bodily assumed. I mean, here's a very important point here. The point being that Gavin is not trying to say, well, you know what, they mentioned Enoch and Elijah. Uh, you know, they don't mention anybody else. Uh, you know, whereas there's an issue that Mary's not mentioned. No, that that is, well, that's part of the argument. But the heart of his argument, I want you to hear it again. The heart of his argument is this right here. Also have numerous lists of the people that are understood to have been assumed bodily to heaven. He is claiming very clearly that we've got lists. These are lists of people that are bodily assumed into heaven. Well, St. Irenaeus forgot about our Lord, who ascended into heaven. Well, maybe he's going to come back and say, well, you know what? He ascended into heaven, so, you know, that's why he wasn't listed there. Even though later on, Gavin will talk about how Christ is listed in these supposed lists. So that won't work, Gavin. But either which way, what, do we, what is evident here? Are these actually lists? No, they're not. And you don't find any, any of these fathers claiming that they're cataloging every name of every figure they believe to have been bodily translated to heaven. That really is not the message of Irenaeus at all. I'll go through a number of these. When Tertullian is expounding the perfection of the resurrection body, he lists Enoch and Elijah as his examples of those who are translated to heaven. Elsewhere, when he's defending the view that the death, that the dead of sin includes death, he gives two exceptions to that, Enoch and Elijah. There's all two. You know, had Gavin actually read it, he would realize that uh, those supposed exceptions are going to return and die in the mind of Tertullian. He was one of those patristic figures that hearkened to the two witness theory um, that became so popular later in history. But um, uh, you, you really got to wonder if Gavin has read all of these supposed lists. Has he read them? Because we don't get we don't get them presented to us by Gavin. I've read them all. We're going to read them all. But Gavin doesn't present them to you. Gavin will put out a video an hour long and will tell you what to believe, but will not present the actual quotes for you. We're going to look at them today, and we're going to look at them in context today. Other passages in Tertullian where he's basically discussing Elijah's assumption, the nature of heaven, the nature of the resurrection body, Mary never comes up. When Irenaeus wants to list examples of those who are translated to heaven to prove that God can resurrect our physical bodies, he lists Enoch and Elijah, no mention of Mary. When Methodius wants to defend the resurrection of the body, he distinguishes between those who rose to die again, like Lazarus, and those who were taken up to immortality, like Enoch and Elijah. Again, no mention of Mary. Now, really, really, when it really became apparent to us that Gavin was rattling off a bunch of fathers who uh, mentioned Enoch and Elijah, sometimes not even together, uh, and not reading the actual text or the context. When that became apparent to us, it was really when we went over the list of Methodius and what Methodius was, uh, was arguing against and arguing for. It became very apparent to me that I very, I very much doubt that Gavin has even read um, these texts, by the way, they're available in New Advent. And because here at Patristic Pillars, we are transparent, you're going to find a link to all of them down below. Uh, they'll all be linked down below. I think only Origin, I think that one is only available. I've got the 
hardbound, hardbound book back there. Not the virtual library, my actual library. I don't think that one is available online, uh, but we don't even need to deal with the origin. We'll find out why later. But uh, when you look at Methodius, I want you to hear what Ortland, what Gavin says again. He wants to defend the resurrection of the body. He distinguishes between those who rose to die again, like Lazarus, and those who were taken up to immortality, like Enoch and Elijah. Again, Why? Why is Methodius mentioning, and not only Enoch and Elijah, why does Methodius mention these figures? Indeed, he doesn't only mention Enoch and Elijah. He's not cataloging a list of those that are bodily assumed or bodily translated. That is not even the point of what Methodius is trying to argue for. Methodius is, is masterful in his defense on the bodily aspect and of the bodily not only the bodily resurrection but the fact that <clears throat> the physical is not evil as many heretical groups did believe Methodius is very clear he says but it is evidently absurd to think that the body will not coexist with the soul in the eternal state okay there we go that is what he's about to deal with it is absurd to think that the body will not coexist with the soul in the eternal state. There you go. But there's more, right? There is more, and he goes on and on. In order, then, that man might not be an undying or ever-living evil, as would have been the case if sin were dominant within him, as it had sprung up in an immortal body, which provided with immortal sustenance, God, for this cause, pronounced him mortal. He's going to talk right now about the body. And he'll talk about it over and over. Why does he mention Enoch and Elijah? Well, he doesn't mention them because he's making or cataloging a list of those that are bodily translated to heaven. No, Methodius is very clear. Indeed, he will bring up very clearly Moses and Elijah, and then later will bring up Enoch. But why does he bring them up? Then, after a little, he says, if then, O oh, origin, you maintain that the resurrection of the body changing into a spiritual body is to be expected only in appearance and put forth the vision of Moses and Elijah as the most convincing proof of it. There you go. There you go. He's dealing with a heresy that the resurrection of the body transforms into a spiritual one, a not a real physical, tangible body, but a spiritual one. Not the way St. Paul uses spiritual, but in the manner of it not being an actual physical body. That is why he brings up Elijah, but he brings up Elijah with Moses. He's not cataloging lists of people that are assumed into heaven. You're wondering, well, why doesn't he bring up Mary that's bodily assumed into heaven? Because his point is to talk about those who clearly appeared in a particular part of scripture with a physical body that were, it was that were thought to have died or been translated to heaven in the case of Elijah, Moses having died, but they have a real physical body now. And he uses the example of the transfiguration. Why would he bring up Mary if he's using the example of the transfiguration? To rebut, to rebut the, her heresy that the resurrected body is merely a spiritual only kind of body. He brings up the transfiguration. Why? Because they wanted to build up, they wanted to set up tents or abodes for them to stay, to stay clearly. And they even offered them food. Clearly, they believed they had physical bodies. They appeared to them physically. It wasn't a mere spectral apparition, it was a physical appearance. So he uses the Transfiguration, as an example, to rebut the heresy. He says, saying that they appeared after the departure from life, preserving no different appearance from that which they had from the beginning. In the same way will be the resurrection of all men. But Moses and Elijah arose and appeared with this form of which you speak before Christ suffered and rose. He's telling you they had an actual body. He uses Enoch and Elijah, but he uses Moses as well. He uses the example of the transfiguration. They're not producing catalogs, lists of those that are bodily translated. 
That is very sensible. That is downright fantasy. I mean, if that were the case, well, goodness, we would have a problem. If you'd be going over Tertullian, Irenaeus, Methodius, Augustan, Ambrose, and, and they're telling you, look, we're producing a list of those that are bodily translated into heaven, and all of them lack Holy Mary. But you don't find that in any of them, in not a one of them. I'm shocked that we were pretty much told that these are assumption of Mary. These are <laughs> clearly not assumption of Mary list. These are assumption lists, and Holy Mary is not present there. Not present there. So what a red flag. Remain Protestant. Convert to Protestantism. Despite the fact that we uh, have no, no clue what is going on in our parishes, as we do not hold to any of the ancient Marian dogmas. Well, maybe Theotokos. Yeah, you know, it's Christological title only, right? Even though it was also meant to give Holy Mary honor, as the great St. Cyril pointed out. What about the perpetual virginity of Mary? The bodily assumption, the immaculate conception. All of these, I argue, are not only biblical, but they're ancient, and we'd be willing to debate you, Dr. Ortland, on all of them, or any of them. But Methodius does go forth, for it is shown by this case that the immortal body, no, that the body is susceptible of immortality, as was also proved by the translation of Enoch. He's not giving you a catalog of those that are translated. He's talking about the body being immortal and then using Enoch as an example. He used the example of the transfiguration because very clearly they wanted to set up abode for them, tents for them. Because they appeared physically to them. It wasn't a mere spectral apparition. It was a physical appearance. They appeared bodily. That was the point. Of, that is the point Methodius is, is putting forth and rebutting the heresy that argues otherwise. And Gavin, you are wrong again. It's not trying to catalog a list of all of those that are bodily assumed or bodily translated. No mention of Mary. When Origen lists exceptions to the general pattern of death, he mentions Enoch and Elijah, not Mary. Now, we, we didn't provide a link to the commentary from Origen. I've got it back there. Uh, because I don't think there would even be a point to him. Uh, I don't even know why Gavin would, uh, would bring up Origen, and, 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 um, and that would be a problem, because right away he tells the audience, Origen is talking about those that uh, avoided death. Brings up Enoch and Elijah. I, I am unsure what, what document from the church, what official magisterial text would argue that Mary avoided death or didn't die. Indeed, the very earliest liturgical texts indicate St. Mary's death. Indeed, the Pope, when he, in Munificentissimus Deus, when it was officially defined as a dogma of the church, very clearly indicates that the earliest liturgies talk about the death of our Immaculate Mother Mary. I don't think it is even worthy of even looking at the commentary from Origen because no Catholic would claim that Mary did not die or it has to be dogmatically believed that she didn't die. Thus, again, there's not a, even if, there, even if that is a list, that uh, he's claiming that the list is of those that escaped death, uh, that is not part of the dogma of the, of the bodily assumption of Mary. And again, yet again, we don't have an early church writer or an early father producing a list of those that are bodily translated into heaven. You don't have it here in origin either, Dr. Ortland. When the Apostolic Constitutions, which is a fourth century compilation of texts dealing with church orders, appeals to examples of the power of God in raising the dead, it mentions Enoch and Elijah. All right, so we now move on to the Apostolic Constitutions, <clears throat> which is an early church document. And we are told, hopefully you can hear me better there. And uh, we are told that yet another list of those that are bodily translated or bodily assumed in heaven. It's here at Gavin Ortland very clearly. I don't want to misrepresent him. Lazarus 
and those who were taken up to immortality, like Enoch and Elijah. Again, no mention of Mary. When Origen lists exceptions to the general pattern of death, he mentions Enoch and Elijah, not Mary. When the Apostolic Constitutions, which is a 4th century compilation of texts dealing with church orders, appeals to examples of the power of God in raising the dead, it mentions Enoch and Elijah. Again, no mention of Mary. Do you notice how uh, when we began this show uh, examining these so-called lists, that we were told that these were lists of those that were bodily translated to heaven? Bodily assumed or bodily translated into heaven. Yet thus far, we've gone through an early church writer, an early church father, an early church father, an early church writer, and now we're going to go to the apostolic constitutions, and not a one of them has been a catalog or a list of those that are bodily translated or assumed into heaven. Not one of them has meant to produce a list of those that are bodily assumed or translated into heaven. Not even one of them. I want you to very carefully note that we have gone through multiple examples already that Dr. Ortland put forth, and not one of them is held up. What is happening here in the Constitution of the Holy Apostles? Do we have an example here, and it would be an incredible example if we had yet another, or if we would encounter an attempt to put a catalog or a list of those that are bodily assumed or bodily translated into heaven. But is this early church document even remotely trying to do that? Even remotely? No. Now that, if it had pleased him <clears throat> that all men should be immortal, it was in his power he showed him the examples of Enoch and Elijah, who were immortal, while he did not suffer them to have any experience of death. Or if it had pleased him in every generation to raise those that died, this also he was able to do. He was made manifest both by himself and others, as when he raised the widow's son by Elijah and the Shunammite's son by Elisha. What is the point of bringing up Enoch and Elijah? If it had pleased him that all men should be immortal, it was in his power he showed in the examples of Enoch and Elijah who were bodily translated, who were immortal, who did not die. But where on earth does, he, does this document claim to be cataloging all of those that are bodily translated or bodily assumed into heaven? Where? Where is it? Or rather, we're told that the example being used is of Enoch and Elijah, who didn't die. They didn't die. That is the example put forth. They remained immortal. They didn't die. No words are attempting to catalog a list of those that were bodily translated. Were instead given Enoch and Elijah and multiple other examples, but Enoch and Elijah because they didn't die. Where are these assumptionless or bodily translationless? Where, pray tell, are they? We haven't even encountered one. We haven't even encountered one father attempting to produce such a list. That is a problem. If we've gone through multiple of these already, and we've yet to encounter one example that holds up to the standard that Gavin Ortland said existed. And I didn't misrepresent him. I played the clip, his clip multiple times. And you wonder why I am so careful in refuting Dr. Ortland is that I have I've grown, I'd be very clear with you. I've grown tired of this kind of apologetic material he just puts forth. You know, I've encountered it from the beginning. When I first began dealing with his material in Mariology, then the purgatory stuff was just same stuff. The Augustine stuff was bad, misrepresenting Augustine. And when it comes to the councils and scripture alone, 
Uh, we've dealt with it every every step of the way. And yet people wonder why I even reply to his videos. Well, um, he is viewed as the anti-James White of Protestantism. What does that mean? That means that apparently he's pretty much producing the same kind of material, but he's doing it in a nice way. He's ironic, very kind, very, very kind, very nice guy. Well, I'll be very clear with you. I don't care how nice you are. If you're trying to take people outside of the one true church, to have them leave the Catholic faith, the faith our Lord founded, and to become Protestant, or to altogether stop your pursuit into apostolic Christianity because of the kind of material being produced here, well, I am going to put effort into refuting that kind of material he's putting forth. Yet again, nothing there. But we move forward. John Chrysostom wants to prove that bodily existence does not make virtue impossible. He appeals to those who do great deeds in the flesh and then are translated to heaven. His examples, Enoch and Elijah, not Mary. Now we now move to John Chrysostomos, the golden mouth one. And uh, yet again, there is no bodily assumption list or bodily translation list at all. Uh, you know, at this point, it, it, it shouldn't become shocking to you anymore. At this point, I'm, I am almost embarrassed that I am going through the whole list. But uh, in a debate that I had not long back on this topic, which, by the way, I think the gentleman that uh, we debated uh, did a fantastic job uh in, in in terms of their reading material i don't think that they won the debate or did or, or presented a good defense of protestantism but i think they did a fantastic job uh because they didn't present arguments like this they they actually read the material they actually read the documents and they didn't bring up uh argumentation that was uh fallacious like this this really just um boggles the mind we're told that they're bodily assumption lists, translation lists, and we're given St. John Chrysostomos, which, again, all it is is talking about great things people have done in the flesh. He doesn't only mention Enoch and Elijah, mentions many other people. Again, this is not a list of those that are bodily translated. Do not accuse the Creator, for if, the wearing, for if wearing the flesh would make virtue impossible, then the fault is not ours but that it does not make it impossible, the band of saints has shown. A nature of flesh did not prevent Paul from becoming what he was. So the flesh doesn't prevent you from becoming great in the Lord, nor Peter from receiving the keys of heaven. Why don't you read that whole, the whole quote here, Dr. Ortlin? Ah, because St. Peter, as the head shepherd, as the holder of the keys of the kingdom of heaven, wouldn't benefit you, would it? By the way, get a hold of our papacy book. Complete Guide to the Bible, to the papacy in the Holy Bible. Get a hold of it. Link right down below. Look down below there. There's a link to our papacy book. You see it there? Get a hold of that book, endorsed by some of the top Eastern scholars and a former head of the Vatican, Vatican Theological Conference. Get a hold of that book. Get it. Get it and let me know what you think about it. And Enoch, also having worn flesh, was translated and not found. So also Elijah was caught up with the flesh. Is this a bodily assumption list, a translation list? No. Rather, it's a list of those that did great things, that were virtuous and had flesh. Elijah was caught up with the flesh. Abraham also with Isaac and his grandson, shone brightly having the flesh. And Joseph in the flesh struggled against that abandoned woman. If this were a list, if these were catalogs of those that were bodily translated into heaven, well, then we would say that he believed that Abraham, Joseph, Isaac, and all of these other figures were bodily translated or bodily assumed. I'm having a hard time. I am having a hard time keeping a straight face as I go through the list. I'm having a very hard time, so please forgive me. If every now and then I chuckle a little bit because I'm having a hard time going through this list and taking it seriously. I, I wonder if Dr. Ortland read the list 
of these fathers, or maybe he, I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't want to think of, you know, I don't want to assume that somebody told him and gave him this list that he never read it or that he got it off the internet without knowing better. I, I don't know. Although we know that that was, that is the case with the previous quote that he got from Eamon Duffy that uh, I argue very strongly was taken from an, a Christ hating website. Now, every time I bring that up, he really, really, really can't stand it, gets mad. That tells me everything I need to know. He got caught there. Uh, but, of course, this is theological material. In the third video, I will present the evidence for that, as I promised, on my Facebook wall. That is coming up. Keep an eye out for that. You're going to love that. We're not done. We're not done exposing those that go to Christ-hating webpages to attack our holy, immaculate mother. We don't hold back here. We do not hold back here. We defend our Immaculate Mother Mary, and we don't care if people come up to us and say, hey, I'm a bona fide scholar. Who are you? Well, we don't bow the knee to academia. We don't bow the knee to academia. Because if we did, well, academia says all kinds of things that are wrong about Holy Mary and the Bible and the faith. Cyril of Jerusalem lists examples of those who are not greater than John, despite being bodily raised to heaven. It's Enoch and Elijah. Not there you go. Is there another list here in St. Cyril of Jerusalem? Time to dig in. We are back yet again. Now we are dealing with St. Cyril of Jerusalem, where, again, it is very evident we're not dealing with any kind of assumption list. At all. Indeed, rather, look at what we're dealing with. Baptism is the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New. For its author was John, than whom was none greater among them that are born of women. The end he was of the prophets, for all the prophets in the law were until John. But of the gospel history, he was the first fruit. For it says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, John came baptizing in the wilderness. You may mention Elias, the Tishbeth, who was taken up into heaven, yet he is not greater than John. Enoch was translated, but he is not greater than John. Moses was a very great lawgiver, and all the prophets were admirable, but not greater than John. He's telling us of great, incredible virtues, incredible possession of just, of being just that these great figures had. He tells you right here, he's dealing with Enoch. He's dealing with Elijah. He's dealing with Moses. Very important, but let's keep going. Look at this. Moses, a great lawgiver. And all the prophets were admirable. Do you think that this is an assumption list? Do you think it is? Because I look at this very clearly. He will mention Enoch and Elijah. But he's talking about the very fact that these are great people that had great virtues, who were incredible in the eyes of God. Enoch and Elijah were translated to heaven, but this is not a list of those that are translated into heaven. He's clearly showing you those that were great and had great virtues, and neither were great greater than John the Baptist. But he doesn't catalog all those that are bodily translated. <clears throat> he mentions Enoch, Elijah, Moses, and all the prophets were admirable, but not greater than John. It is not I that dare to compare prophets with prophets, but their master and ours, the Lord Jesus, declared it. Declared it. So not even St. Cyril of Jerusalem, not even he, is attempting to catalog a list of those that are bodily translated or bodily assumed. Now, you may say, well, you know, William, you keep running into Enoch and Elijah. Yeah, keep running into a lot of figures, not only them. We keep running into a lot of figures. They get mentioned often because they were virtuous. Virtuous. And they get mentioned in regards to being immortal, to not having died. But never do we ever encounter a father who says, hey, we are compiling a list of those bodily assumed into heaven we're compiling a list of them 
We've got Enoch and Elijah here, but we don't have Mary. Well, of course, they're not going to say we don't have Mary because according to Gavin Ortland, they didn't believe in the bodily assumption. But what is going on here is very clear to us that all of these figures are mentioned for a clear reason in the context whether to defend the bodily resurrection, to show that they're great and virtuous, magnificent saints and prophets, but none greater than John the Baptist, or for some other reason. But we have yet to encounter one father trying to catalog a list of who he believes, of figures that he believes were bodily translated. That was not the point of any of these fathers that we've encountered yet. Not a one of them. Mary. Later, he references Jesus' ascension and references Enoch and Elijah's translation to heaven, as well as Paul's, Paul's travel to heaven, as well as the story of Habakkuk's translation from Israel to Babylon, which was a, a myth uh, that some believed. Still, Mary never comes up. When Jerome wants to exposit the nature of the resurrection body, he gives examples. It's Enoch and Elijah, not Mary. But indeed, what we encounter in St. Jerome is very similar to everything else that we've encountered thus far. Indeed, you find a masterful defense of the bodily resurrection in St. Jerome. He tells us the true confession of the resurrection declares that the flesh will be glorious, but without destroying its reality. And when the apostle says in 1 Corinthians 15, this is corruptible and mortal, his words denote this very body, that is to say, the flesh which was then seen. But when he adds that it puts on incorruption and immortality, he does not say that that which is put on, that is the clothing, does away with the body which it adorns in glory, but that it makes that body glorious which before lacked glory, so that the more worthless robe of mortality and weakness being laid aside, we may be clothed with a gold of immortality and, so to speak, with a blessedness of strength as well as virtue, since we wish not to be stripped of the flesh, but to be put on over it a vesture of glory and desire to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Notice that after noting that, he then goes on to the example of the transfiguration. Accordingly, our Lord was not so transfigured on the mountain that he lost his hands and feet and other members, and suddenly began to roll along in a round shape like that of the sun or of a bull. But the same members glowed with the brightness of the sun and blinded the eyes of the apostles. Hence also his garments were changed, but so as to become white and glistening, not aerial. For I suppose you do not intend to maintain that his clothes were also spiritual. Again, he's defending the bodily nature. The bodily nature, the resurrection is truly bodily. The transfiguration was bodily, just like the other fathers defended the bodily nature of it. Remember, they wanted to pitch tents for them, abodes for them to stay in, because at the transfiguration, they truly appeared there before the apostles. They appeared there. Notice what he says. Enoch was translated in the flesh. Elias was carried up, in, up to heaven in the flesh. They are not dead. They are inhabitants of paradise. And even there retained the members with which they were wrapped away and translated. He's not, again, he is not making an exhaustive list of those, of those that were bodily assumed. Doesn't make any sense at all. He's not making an exhaustive list of those that are bodily assumed in heaven. Rather, he is showing you that the physical the physical nature of the bodily resurrection is a very true reality. That is why he focuses on 1 Corinthians immediately. And then he brings up Enoch, who was translated in the flesh, and Elijah, who was carried up to heaven. They're not dead, is his point. They're inhabitants of paradise, and they retain the members of which they were wrapped away and translated. Again, this is not an exhaustive list by any means. Ambrose wants to list those who are caught up to be alive with Christ. He lists Enoch and Elijah, along with Paul and some apostles. 
but not Mary. When Augustus Again, we, we have got to emphasize the point, the point made here about the points made by St. Jerome before we move over to St. Ambrose and then St. Augustine to conclude a, our examination of these so-called assumptionless. But you look at Jerome, and Jerome is making a very clear and important point that we hope is not forgotten. That point is the importance of the fact that the bodily nature of these figures is emphasized. And he notice how he focuses very clearly on the transfiguration and the bodily resurrection of Christ. He is not cataloging or even attempting to catalog a list of those that are bodily translated to heaven. We now move on to the great St. Ambrose, spiritual father of the great and masterful St. Augustine. When we look at Ambrose, uh, yet again, as is the case with all of these figures, there's nothing even remotely close to a, a, a list of those that are bodily assumed in heaven. Again, like all of the other fathers, you're, you're going to encounter a bunch of figures listed here, a bunch of them. Not only Enoch and Elijah. Now, are Enoch and Elijah mentioned? Of course they're mentioned, but they're not the only ones that are mentioned. Very, very clear. They are not the only ones that are mentioned. So yet again, we encounter another very misleading thing. You come in here, come in here. We're, we're, we're defending the Catholic faith. Wait, hold on. Who, who's, who's, uh, who's the mother of God? Mary. Yeah. And we don't like it when people attack Holy Mother Mary, right? No, right? We don't like that. We take care of things when Holy Mother Mary gets attacked. Okay, wait over there, baby girl. So we, we read, Paul certainly is dead, and by his honorable passion exchanged the life of the body for everlasting glory. Did he then deceive himself when he wrote that he should be caught up alive in the clouds to meet Christ? Okay, do we have um, a list of those that are assumed? Not at all. If you notice him, we read, we read the same two of Enoch and of Elijah who will be caught up in the spirit. Lo, the chariot of Elijah, lo, the fire, though not seen or prepared, that the just may ascend, the innocent be born forth, and your life may not know death. For indeed the apostles knew not death. He's talking about those that live on, that live on in God, that continually live in eternal life. For he lives, we read, who has nothing in him which can die, who is not from Egypt, any sure or bond, but has put it off before laying aside the service of this body. And so not Enoch alone is alive, for not he alone was, was caught up. Paul also was caught up to meet Christ. So there yet again is not a list, not an assumption list here, yet again. But rather, clearly those that continually live in Christ, that live in Christ. So not Enoch alone is alive. For not he alone was caught up. Paul also was caught up to meet Christ. The patriarchs also live. This is not a list of those that are bodily assumed. The patriarchs also live. For God could not be called the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, except the dead were living. For he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, a classical text to show that the saints continually live in Christ, in heaven. They're more alive more alive now that they are in heaven in eternal glory than they when they were here on earth. That is the message here. The patriarchs also live, and we too shall live if we be willing to copy the deeds and habits of our predecessors. The goal is not to catalog all those that are bodily assumed to heaven, but rather to show that these great and virtuous patriarchs, these great and virtuous saints, these incredible figures continually live in heaven. But note that this point is clear. Enoch and Elijah, that were bodily translated, they're not the only ones that continually live. The patriarchs live, and we too will live, provided we be willing to copy the works and the habits of those that preceded us. That is the message of St. Ambrose, not an attempt to catalog all those that were bodily translated into heaven. That is not even on his mind. He doesn't tell you, here is a list of those that are bodily translated. 
He lists a number of figures, but he also talks about the patriarchs who live. Now, does he say that Enoch and Elijah and Paul are caught up in heaven? Sure he does. Will Gavin come back and say, well, he doesn't say Mary? That's not the point. He's not cataloging every figure that was bodily translated. He doesn't tell us that that's what he's doing. If you want to make the positive case that that is what he's doing, you've got to show us the evidence, but because the evidence is not there. Rather, the opposite. He's talking about those that continually live in Christ. He doesn't only mention them, but the patriarchs. And we are lumped in there that we will live eternally in the Lord as well. Provided we continue, we finish the race. When Augustine references Faustus's belief that Elijah, Moses, and Enoch were bodily assumed to heaven, it's just those three. And then later, he himself references Kylestius's question about the location of Enoch and Elijah, and he rebukes him for asking that. Mary never comes up. So the point is, the church fathers are not silent about listing people who are assumed to heaven. There's plenty of times where you'd expect that somewhere this is going to come up, that, well, it wasn't just Enoch and Elijah. Actually, the most important person, the most important creature, Mary, the queen of heaven, she also was assumed to heaven. You'd kind of think that would come up somewhere. So we're going to look at Augustine now. St. Augustine will round off our examination and Indeed, what exactly is going on with St. Augustine? And really, when you read uh, Augustine, you find that, yet again, there is not a list of those that are bodily assumed in Augustine. But rather, he's rebuking Faustus. Because what Faustus is doing, remember Faustus very clearly denied, denied the virgin birth, very, very, very clear about not believing in it, despite even Augustine recording him saying that he desired to, but of course he denied it. Faustus of Manichaean was famous for his docetism. So Augustine, the great St. Augustine, doctor of the church and patristic pillar, is using points that are common ground that Faustus does agree with. He tells them right here, if Elijah, contrary to nature, lives forever, why not allow that Jesus with no greater contrariety to nature, could remain in death for three days. Besides that, if not only Elias, but Moses and Enoch, you believe to be immortal and you have been taken up with their bodies to heaven. Accordingly, if it is a good argument that Jesus was a man because he died, it is an equally good argument that Elijah was not a man because he did not die. So he's finding common ground here, noting that there is agreement in the belief that Enoch, Elijah, and Moses are immortal. This is believed. Faustus believes this. So he's using common ground here to show that the denial of very important Christology just really has no basis in the theology of the Manichaeans. And he very clearly notes it over and over. He tells you the truth is, if you will believe it, that the Hebrews were in a mistake regarding both the death of Jesus and the immortality of Elijah, for it is equally untrue that Jesus died and Elijah did not die. But you believe whatever you please, and for the rest, you appeal to nature. And allowing this appeal, nature is against both the death of the immortal and the immortality of the mortal. And if we refer to the power of effecting their purpose as possessed by God and man, it seems more possible for Jesus to die that Elijah not to die. For the power of Jesus is greater than that of Elijah, but if you exalt the weaker to heaven, though nature is against him, forgetting his condition as a mortal, endow him with eternal felicity. Why should I not admit that Jesus could die if he pleased, even though I were to grant his death to have been real and not a mere semblance? For as from the outset of his taking the likeness of man, he underwent in appearance all the experiences of humanity. It was quite consistent that he should complete the system by appearing to die. So here is what is going on here in his Contra Faustum. So it is, it is the very clear point, as we've pointed out before. Faustus insists that Jesus might have died, Though not born, remember, he denies the incarnation by the exercise of divine power, yet he rejects birth and death alike. Augustine maintains that there are some things that even God cannot do, one of which is to die. He refutes the docetism, the docetism 
of the Manichaeans. And he does so by finding common ground, noting there are certain things that we agree on. Certain things, notice, <clears throat> it is not only Elijah, but Moses and Enoch, you believe to be immortal and to have been taken up with their bodies to heaven. He's not making a catalog, a list of those that have been bodily assumed, but rather finding common ground, all the while refuting Faustus. But again, in Augustine, all we find is inquiries into the faith. But he's greatly mistaken in this opinion. The questions which he supposes to be outside of the faith are of a very different character from those in which, without any detriment to the faith, whereby we are Christians, there exists either an ignorance of the real fact and a consequent suspension of any fixed opinion, or else a conjectural view of the case which, owing to the infirmity of human thought, Issues and conceptions at variance with truth, as when a question arises about the description and locality of that paradise where God placed man whom he formed out of the ground without any disturbance. However, of the Christian belief that there undoubtedly is such a paradise, or as when it is asked where Elijah is at the present moment, and where Enoch, whether in this paradise or in some other place, although we doubt not of their existing still in the same bodies in which they were born, or as when one inquires whether it was in the body or out of the body, that the apostle was caught up to the third heaven, an inquiry, however, which betokens great lack of modesty on the part of those who would fain know what he who is the subject of the mystery itself expressly declares his ignorance of without impairing his own belief of the fact or as when the question is started, how many are those heavens to the third of which he tells us that he was caught up or whether the elements of this visible world are four or more? What is what it is which causes those eclipses of the sun or the moon, which astronomers are in the habit of foretelling for certain appointed seasons? Why again men of ancient times lived at the age which Holy Scripture assigns to them and whether the period of their period, you get the point, don't you? You get the point, don't you? He's dealing with paradise. He's dealing with many issues of the faith. Many things that are really mysteries. He's not simply because he mentions Enoch and Elijah listing everybody that was bodily assumed. Rather, he's dealing with a question of Enoch and Elijah. He's dealing with a question of paradise. He's dealing with questions that come up from Holy Scripture. He's dealing with many questions i mean i'm looking at it and i'm blown away i mean the very fact that he is answering questions of those that are inquiring about the faith and you see the name enoch and elijah and right away you assume okay well he is making up a list of those that are bodily assumed or translated in heaven it couldn't be anything further from the truth Rather, he's talking about paradise, mentions them, and says, okay, when questions arise about them, arise about paradise, arise even about puberty, arise about the elements of the visible world, arise about many things. We then deal with them, and then there are some that are obscure that even we don't know the answer to. He tells you. Very clearly. Now, who does not feel, amidst the various and innumerable questions of this sort, which relate either to God's most hidden operations or to most obscure passages of the scriptures, and which it is difficult to embrace and define in any certain way, that ignorance may on many points be compatible with sound Christian faith, and that occasionally erroneous opinion may be entertained without any room for the imputation of heretical doctrine. So, there has been nothing, nothing of substance. We have gone through all of the fathers and church writers that Dr. Ortland has put forth, and in not one of them have we encountered an attempt or even, even an implication that there is a desire to produce a list of those that are bodily assumed in heaven. We haven't encountered it even, even once in any of these figures. We looked at Augustine, very clearly saw the message put forth. 
that besides that, it is not only Elias, but Moses and Enoch, you believe to be immortal and to have been taken up with their bodies to heaven. Accordingly, it is a good argument that Jesus was a man because he died. It is an equally good argument that Elijah was not a man because he did not die. Notice how he's finding common ground here with Faustus in this uh, dialogue that we have here in Augustine. But we went through every single father, every single ecclesiastical writer, every single document quoted, every document quoted by Gavin Oral. There's nothing there. Nothing there at all. We looked at Tertullian. We had already answered him in Tertullian, clearly. We looked at the charge of Tertullian. Nothing there. Very clearly, Tertullian subscribing to the two witness theory, the Enoch and Elijah will return to die later, as we saw that. Nothing there in Irenaeus, nothing in Methodius, who's talking about the bodily resurrection, the bodily origin, nothing there. We didn't even bother to look at origin because of the claim that, you know, origin is talking about something not even, not even part of the dogma of the assumption, not even worthy of looking at as uh, Gavin Ortland rightly admits. Constitutions of the Holy Apostles, we looked at that, there's nothing there, nothing in John Chrysostomos, we looked at Cyril of Jerusalem, St. Jerome de Pomachius, Ambrose and the death of Satyrus, Augustine, his reply to Faustus, and is on the grace of Christ and an original sin in none of these places. And indeed, even if we would have encountered one father that was only focusing on Enoch and Elijah, doesn't prove anything because none of them were trying to drop a list of those bodily translated. None of them make that claim. And in the context, that's not what they're doing. None of the fathers that Gavin Oatland put forth. I've got to be very clear that I was very underwhelmed by the supposed assumption list. Remember what Gavin told you, audience, that there are multiple, a bunch of early fathers that had a bodily assumption list. I quoted him earlier. You know, I quoted him very clearly earlier. You know, I didn't even need to quote him. I put his actual video on for you. And indeed, what we encounter is a lot of, a whole lot of nothing for Gavin's case. We encounter a whole lot of incredible theology because the fathers are overflowing with masterful theology. But what we don't encounter is anything to bolster Gavin Ortland's case against the bodily assumption of Mary. In part three, we will look at Revelation 3, the early church fathers, and the early reformers in a massive finale to this series. Have you been edified? Let me know down below. Remember, you are the reason our videos spread and get noticed, and people are able to be edified as you're edified. I don't care what comment you can leave down below, a thumbs up only, or thank you, William, or hey, I liked it, or hey, I didn't like it, or hey, maybe you can improve it by touching upon this. Any comment to help will the algorithm will go a long way. Thank you for tuning in, and God bless you, and God keep you.